One of the central biological themes is this relationship between structure and function. And the double helix itself is a huge representation of how structure and function are so closely linked in biology. So Watson and Crick notice that this specific base sequence and this pairing system that they suggested was was very likely um, part of a copying mechanism for the genetic material. So since the two strands of DNA are complementary, each strand can act as a template for building a new strand when the DNA is replicating. So the parent model, I'm sorry, the parent molecule will unwind and two new daughter strands are built based on the base pairing rules. So here's your parent molecule, which separates at the hydrogen bonds, and then the nucleotides will come in and bond with the corp excuse me, the corresponding bases according to the base pairing rules. So each of the new strands will have a parental strand and will have a daughter strand or some new DNA molecules. Um, and there are three different ways this can happen. This can happen with a conservative model here. In the, in the conservative model, the original DNA model is conserved. But you can see that by the time of the fourth replication here, you have still the original DNA model and then three brand new um, pieces of DNA, which could be result in a problem if there were some form of mutation. In the semi-conservative model, the DNA strand splits and then you have new DNA built around each strand. So in this model, you only have two brand new pieces of DNA um, after the second replication and two half of the DNA half of half of the DNA contains an original strand. In the dispersive model, it's essentially like cutting up portions of the model and rebuilding the places between it, um, which I think it's pretty obvious to see how many different ways this could possibly um, go wrong or something could, um, some mutation could occur in this dispersive model. So Watson and Crick decided that the semi-conservative model of replication excuse me, is uh, is the most likely scenario because each daughter molecule will have an old strand which is conserved from the parent molecule and one that is newly made. So that's why it's called semi-conservative. The competing models um, were the uh, conservative model and the dispersive model which we just looked at. So experiments by Matthew Mieselson and Franklin Stahl supported this semi-conservative model. They were able to label nucleotides of the old strands with a heavy isotope of nitrogen, and the new nucleotides were lab labeled with a lighter isotope. And the first replication produced hybrid DNA, which eliminated the conservative model. And the second replication produced both light and hybrid DNA, which eliminated the dispersive model. So the, the semi-conservative model is what was supported as a result of the, this experimentation. Well, here is a picture of this experimentation here. So as you can see, during the first replication, the conservative model was eliminated. And during the second replication, the dispersive model was eliminated, making the semi-conservative model the only possibility for how DNA was replicated. So the copying of DNA is pretty remarkable. Um, it happens very quickly, and it is a very accurate uh, replication. It's a very accurate process. And it requires more than a dozen enzymes and m um, multiple proteins that participate. So replication begins at a particular site called the origin of replication. So two DNA strands are separated at the origin of replication, which opens up a replication bubble. And a eukaryotic chromosome may have hundreds or thousands of origins of replication because of all of the, the multiple chromosomes that exist within that cell. So replication will then proceed in both directions from each origin until the entire molecule is copied. So this is happening in E. coli right here. So right now we are looking at an origin of replication in a prokaryotic cell. So if you look, you have your double-stranded molecule, which is circular. And when one of the sides, there, uh, there's a, uh, an enzyme that kind of splits the two strands apart, and you end up with a bubble on the inside. And so um, the new molecule is built on the inside here, as represented in light blue. 
and um, and this continues all the way around until there are actually two separate pieces of DNA. So the place where the um, two original strands separate is referred to as the replication fork. So this right here on the bottom right is a diagram of of um, DNA replication actually occurring within an E. coli cell. In a eukaryotic cell, it's slightly different because our chromosomes are linear. So as you can see, the bubble will form just as it did in the circular chromosome. And uh, this right here would be a replication fork. And these arrows represent the fact that the, um, the replication of DNA is proceeding in two directions. So we'll go in both directions, both to the left and to the right. And so the end result is two daughter molecules. Okay, so at the end of each replication bubble, you see the replication fork, which I've pointed out to. That's a Y-shaped region where the new strands are elongating. Helicases are the enzymes that are going to untwist the double helix at the replication fork. So the helicase is the enzyme that will take the helix apart. Single-stranded binding proteins are these special proteins that will stabilize the single-stranded DNA and keep it from kind of twisting and winding back together. And then there's also something called topoisomerase, and that corrects the overwinding ahead of the replication fork by breaking, swiveling, and rejoining DNA strands. So um, the topoisomerase kind of keeps the DNA in the right position so that replication can occur with as few mistakes as possible. So here's your topoisomerase, which is preventing this DNA from getting all twisted. Think about what happens if you have yarn and you try to separate two pieces. Well, the yarn itself is twisted, so when you try to separate the two pieces, the, um, the portion of that piece of yarn or string that is still together becomes all kinds of crumpled up and messy. So here we have helicase coming through, separating our two strands of DNA, and then the single-stranded binding proteins represented here in gray prevent the two, uh, the two strands from uh, bonding back together. And then we have a primase here, which is an RNA primer that's going to put an, R well, it puts an RNA primer in for, uh, from the 5' end to the 3' end, which is the direction in which our... DNA is going to be synthesized. So DNA polymerases can't initiate the synthesis of the polynucleotide, so they can't put the nucleotides together, but they can add nucleotides only to the three prime end. So the initial nucleotide is the short RNA primer, which you see here. So this RNA primer is put in place, and then the replication of the DNA proceeds in this direction towards the three prime end. So um, an enzyme called primase can start an RNA chain from scratch and it adds RNA nucleotides one at a time and it uses the parental DNA as our template. So the primer is going to be relatively short, maybe 5 to 10 nucleotides, and the 3' prime end serves as the starting point for the new DNA strand. So um, there are enzymes called DNA polymerases and they catalyze the elongation of DNA at a replication fork. So most of these polymerases require a primer and then a DNA template strand. So when DNA is copied, the rate of elongation is approximately 500 nucleotides per second in bacteria and only 50 per second in human cells. So each nucleotide that's added to a growing DNA strand is a nucleoside triphosphate. DATP is going to supply adenine to DNA and it's very similar to the ATP that is used for energy in most of the metabolic processes that we discuss, but the difference is in their sugar. So DATP has a, a deoxyribose, while ATP just has a ribose sugar. So as each monomer of DATP joins the DNA strand, it loses two phosphate groups as a molecule of something which we call pyrophosphate. So you can see here that we are using our nucleoside triphosphate here and as um, as this nucleoside is bonded here to this nucleotide, this pyrophosphate or these two inorganic phosphates are lost. And as a result, 
um, the two bases are bonded together. Okay, the anti-parallel structure of the double helix is going to have an effect on replication. So DNA polymerases add nucleotides only to the free three prime end of a growing strand. So a new DNA strand elongates from the five prime end towards the three prime end, always from the five to three prime. So along one template strand of DNA, the DNA polymerase is going to synthesize a leading strand continuously, moving towards the replication fork. So on this side, you have a leading strand. See right here? The other side we call a lagging strand. So um, here's our origin of replication. So we've got our replication bubble. And here is the five prime end here. And you can see that as this piece of DNA is elongating, it's doing so towards the three prime end. Okay, so it's building from the five to the three prime. So our RNA primer, or our, the enzymes come in, attach our RNA primer. Then there's a, our ligase or a type of um, enzyme here that's going to add the nucleotides towards the three prime end. Okay, and this is our parental DNA. So eventually what you see here is that these are being added towards the replication fork and the helicase continues to move in this direction and this is able to continue to replicate. The lagging strand, however, um, it has to work in the direction <coughs> that moves away from the replication fork. So we call this, um, it has to be synthesized in pieces and these pieces are called Okazaki fragments and those get joined together by DNA ligase. So, okay, so if you look here, there are also portions of the, um, portions of the DNA that has to be replicated, I'm going to call it behind the origin of replication, because remember, the overall direction of replication is in, it's, a, it's in both directions from the origin. So if you look, here you have your template DNA, and you have a primer that's put in place. And then again, uh, the, the DNA repli is replicated from the five prime end and it keeps being built on the three prime end. So you see how that happens? Well, eventually it will hit a primer that had already been in place previously. So you can see here, up here, this is the second, it looks like two right here. And now we hit one, this is the primer, the initial primer here. So um, once this strand meets, we get DNA ligase right here which comes in and it will remove the primer and glue the glue essentially the two ends of the DNA together so that we end up with uh, a complete strand of DNA but the overall direction is to the left because you can see that this fragment on the right was formed prior to the fragment on the left so um, this happens in bacteria as well. So you can see in bacterial DNA replication, you have your origin of replication and um, the lagging strands are built in Okazaki fragments, which are then connected by DNA ligase. The proteins that participate in DNA replication form a huge complex, relatively huge complex, uh, which could be referred to as a DNA replication machine. It may be stationary during the replication process. Recent studies, though, support a model in which the DNA polymerase molecules reel in parental DNA and extrude or push out newly made daughter DNA molecules. So these complexes, these, um, these enzymes would actually stay in place and the DNA molecules would be unzipped and pushing through, uh, through the, through the, uh, the enzymes as opposed to the enzymes moving along the DNA. So there are DNA polymerases that proofread our newly made DNA and they'll replace incorrect nucleotides. Um, in a mismatched pair of DNA, um, the repair enzymes correct errors that were made in base pairing. 
uh, DNA can also be damaged by exposure to 